Thank you for coming to my defense presentation. Today I'll be speaking about the work that I've done through my PhD entitled Mountain Glaciers as Modifiers of Streamflow in Western Canada, Insights from Data Analysis and Machine Learning. I've done this work under the supervision of Dr. Valentina Radich, as well as with the support of my committee members, Mark Jelinek, Mark Schmidt, and Ali Ameli. The loss of glaciers over the coming decades will have far-reaching and profound cultural, political, and social implications because glaciers and the rivers they feed have both broad and deep importance. For example, the Athabasca River in Alberta has offered space for food sourcing and knowledge sharing for thousands of years, and the headwaters are shown here on the left. Glacier retreat in transboundary basins like the Columbia are geopolitically complicated as Canada and the United States renegotiate water management treaties in the coming years. Furthermore, glacier fed rivers are used for municipal water supply, irrigation and hydropower generation. A problem in Western Canada is that we know that we will lose a majority of glacier ice by the end of the century. However, understanding these specific downstream impacts is actually quite complicated. And the reasons for these challenges um, are multifaceted. First, glacier retreat is ubiquitous and is occurring across glaciated regions on Earth in response to modern climate change. However, the glacier runoff response differs in both space and time. Some basins respond with enhanced ice melt due to rising temperatures, while others respond with decreased ice melt due to diminishing glacier areas. And then the downstream importance of glaciers is strongly dependent on the local context, where different basins have different population densities, distributions, and water demands. In short, the importance of glacier runoff is highly heterogeneous in both space and time, despite the nearly ubiquitous loss of ice globally. As such, a more thorough understanding of the role of glaciers is necessary and urgent at local and regional scales. However, we frequently lack the data that's required to either calibrate or resolve processes within glacier runoff models at the scales of interest. And so it can be quite challenging to understand the downstream importance of glacier runoff. But what else can we do? I'll ask you to close your eyes and imagine that you're standing at a place where three different rivers meet. One river is fed by many glaciers in its headwaters, another is fed by fewer glaciers, and the third river is fed by no glaciers. And think to yourself, if you knew nothing about where the glaciers were, but you stood there and you felt the weather and you watched these rivers for a year, could you tell which is which? And if you stood there for several decades, how much could you learn about the role of glaciers by observing stream flow at these three rivers? And if you open your eyes, this thought experiment is really where my PhD began. In Western Canada, there are hundreds of stream gauge stations that have recorded daily stream flow for decades. And I ask, how much can we learn about the downstream importance of glaciers and their roles through the analysis of stream flow data instead of through modeling glacier runoff? And I explore um, this idea through each chapter of my thesis. First, in chapter two, I ask which communities' water supplies would be most impacted by the loss of glacier ice in Alberta? Then, in chapter three, I ask how well can deep machine learning models predict stream flow across a glaciated region? Leading to chapter four, where I ask how can the decision making of such deep machine learning hydrological models be interpreted? And then finally, in chapter five, I ask, how does the stream flow response to heat waves vary across Western Canada? And by how much do glaciers control this response? Overall, I consider that if glaciers really matter for stream flow, then we should be able to figure out practically and pragmatically by how much they matter by analyzing these stream flow data sets. To begin, in chapter two, I ask, which communities' water supplies would be most impacted by the loss of glacier ice in Alberta? And this is actually quite a challenging question to answer. So to begin, I consider two simpler questions. First, in the historical record, when, where, and by how much have glaciers mattered for stream flow? And then second, where do communities get their water from? Relative to non-glacier-fed rivers, glacier-fed rivers have a higher mean summer flow due to the fact that glacier runoff sustains stream flow even after the seasonal snowpack has melted. 
Glacier-fed rivers also have relatively smaller interannual variability since gl glacier runoff counteracts the variability from precipitation in summertime. So we can begin by asking, are these two key signals present and how important are they in the historical summer stream flow data? I use over two decades of daily stream flow data at 194 stream gauge stations shown in Alberta here. Then I use principal component analysis along with self-organizing maps to group these stations according to their similarity in August stream flow behavior. Notably, one group of stations is found downstream of glaciers, meaning that this group of glacier-fed rivers behaves differently than others in the historical record. Then, considering the variability of summer flow versus the mean summer flow, we see very clearly that the glacier-fed rivers achieve high mean flow with low variability, while non-glacier-fed rivers only achieve higher mean flows at the cost of high variability. And these are those two key signals that we are looking for. To model these behaviors, then, I find that glacier-fed rivers can be predicted using the area fraction of glacier coverage, while non-glacier-fed rivers can be predicted using climate and geographic metrics. Then, the impact of deglaciation can be estimated for a location as being the difference between these two modeling approaches. What we really need to know then is where do communities get their water from? So I collected water source data for nearly 600 communities, in many cases by directly contacting local administrative officers and utility providers to create a unique data set that spans the whole province. And overall, I find that there are four locations that are most vulnerable to the loss of glacier ice. The towns of Hinton and Rocky Mountain House, the village of Lake Louise, and the Bighorn Dam, which is the largest reservoir in the province, downstream of which over one million people source their water. Shown here is August stream flow results for historical and pseudo deglaciation scenarios for these, th for these locations. What we see is, I think, really quite striking. Considering Hinton, there is a substantial decrease in mean summer flows, as well as a substantial increase in the variability of possible flows, both of these features making water management much more challenging in a scenario without glaciers. This study is important because it's at key relevant scales. Policymakers require detailed information at local scales, which has been hard to achieve using glacier runoff models. At the same time, we live in a world where there are glaciated regions, and so deglaciation has regional expressions. This study really lives at this intersection and differs from other studies in the literature that provide valuable information at different scales. So I published this chapter in Nature Climate Change in 2020. I also did national and local media interviews in print and on TV, in addition to writing an essay for the Springer Nature Sustainability Community. Moving forwards, this project highlighted that there is potential to take advantage of widely available stream flow data, motivating considerations beyond Alberta, beyond glacier runoff, and beyond August. To take advantage of these opportunities, in chapter three, I began by asking, how well can deep machine learning models predict stream flow across a glaciated region? Here, I'll use regional stream flow data to train a deep machine learning model. Recently, the deep learning approach is to use Bayesian averaged variables to drive a deep learning model that predicts stream flow at a single basin at a time. What's different about my approach is that I explicitly incorporate spatial information into my model by driving it with spatially discretized variables in order to predict stream flow at multiple basins simultaneously across a glaciated region. I consider 226 stream gauge stations across British Columbia and Alberta. On the right are seasonal hydrographs of different geographic subregions highlighting how rain, snowmelt, and glacier melt differently drive stream flow throughout the region in both space and time. Then I use daily precipitation, minimum temperature, and maximum temperature from ERA-5 reanalysis structured as an image. And I model, I use the model input as year-long weather videos with 365 frames where each frame is a daily weather image. 
The model then has two main components. First, a convolutional neural network, which learns the spatial features, and then a long short-term memory neural network, which learns the temporal links between these spatial features. The output is the next day of stream flow at each of the stations being predicted. To evaluate the similarity between observed and modeled stream flow, I use the nash sutcliffe efficiency, or NSE, where values closer to one indicate better performance. The median NSE on the test set is 0.67, which is considered quite good overall, but what's interesting is the strong regional differences in performance. The best performance is in mainland BC and mountainous parts of Alberta, and the worst performance is in the more arid eastern region. But let's look at a couple examples. Shown here, where the observations are in black, but the modeled results are in blue, we can see that where the model succeeds, it actually works as well as or even outperforms existing process-based models in the literature. In these two examples, we can see that the deep learning model is good at capturing both the seasonal as well as the daily scale fluctuations from rain, snowmelt, or glacier melt. But in the eastern and more arid prairie region, the model performs worse than process-based models, which is actually similar to other deep learning models that struggle to perform well in arid regions. Here, the freshet is not well simulated by the deep learning model. Overall, I would summarize the model's performance in one sentence. When it's good, it's very good. But when it's bad, it's actually better. I say that because it's this combination of successes and failures that offers us an opportunity to think critically about when, where, and why deep learning is a suitable modeling approach. And I'm going to come back to these ideas a little bit later on. This study focused on the region of southwestern Canada for the past several decades. However, I think there are clear ways to expand the scope of this approach. The ERA-5 back extension and climate models could be used to gain insights from 1950 through 2100, while the spatial scale of the study could be made more local or more global since ERA-5 is available globally and at finer resolution. And I think when it comes to this expansion of scales, there are many open questions as to how to try to do this and how to make it work in a physically sensible way, which I'm excited to think with you through in the discussion period. Overall, this study presents a novel and successful modeling approach for streamflow simulation across glaciated basins and was published earlier this year in Hydrology and Earth System Sciences. This photo actually was taken from the top of Mount Seymour a couple of years ago on the North Shore in Vancouver. And I chose it here because as we were coming down, the topography really reminded me of the gradient descent algorithms that are used in training of these deep learning models. So next, it's important to consider not only the accuracy of the model, but also why does it work? In chapter four, I want to know how can the decision making of deep machine learning hydrological models be interpreted? Here, we'll take those same models from chapter three and try to uncover what's going on within them. In the thesis, I investigate many different interpretability questions, and today I'll just discuss one for time, and that is where in space does the model focus? To understand where in space is most important, I perform a spatial sensitivity analysis, and I determine daily sensitivity maps that show the areas of the input that are most closely linked to the model output. And I can visualize these sensitivity maps as they vary through time, shown here for the central region, where red indicates more sensitive areas that are more closely linked to the output. The model focuses on the west coast during the low flow period, but then will shift its focus to the basin areas during spring and summer. In other words, when stream flow is dynamic, so when stream flow can change day to day, the model uses within basin information to make its predictions. But if we consider the Eastern Prairie region, so this is where the model's predictions failed, especially in spring, we see something of a different behavior. The model's focus still cycles between the West Coast during winter and then to the basin regions during summer, but the model's focus actually lingers on the West Coast during the spring freshet. So in other words, when the model fails in spring, it's looking in the wrong place. 
These findings suggest that accurate stream flow simulations are enabled by physically sensible connections between the input and output data, while inaccurate simulations are not. And I investigate many other aspects of model interpretability as well. I'll briefly mention a few key takeaways here and again look forward to discussion on these ideas after the presentation. I find that glacier runoff may be represented by LSTM cell states. I demonstrate ways that climate is linked to streamflow regime. And I explore how modeled streamflow is generated in different ways in different rivers. Importantly, that the model has learned that melt drives flow in summer in glaciated basins, but not in non-glaciated basins. Taken together, these and other examples paint a picture that overall, the model is making physically sensible predictions. Interpretation is the bridge to application, and these tests begin to reveal the applications for which this model is most suitable. What I've done here is really adapt techniques, ideas, and motivations from across different sources in the literature, modifying and expanding them for this chapter here. This study really is about combining these different ways of thinking, and I expand knowledge in the field by explicitly considering glacier runoff for these tests. In the end, this study was also published earlier this year in the Water and Artificial Intelligence subsection of Frontiers in Water. With a model that works and appears to work for the right reasons, in chapter five, I then ask, how does the streamflow response to heat waves vary across Canada? And by how much do glaciers control this response? This chapter was motivated by the unprecedented heat wave across BC in June of 2021, where temperature anomalies reached 20 degrees above normal. Different rivers responded very differently to this destructive event, in large part due to the role that glaciers play. Here are river flows for a river with few glaciers. In black is 2021, while blue shows the historical normal. During the heat wave, flows increased due to snowmelt, but low flows persisted for months afterwards. In this highly glaciated basin, however, there was a similar early rise in flow due to snowmelt, but summer flows were much more normal in large part due to glacier runoff that sustained flows through summer. Put in context, this heat wave occurred at subseasonal timescales, in contrast to other notable heat waves like summer 2003 in Europe. Most glaciohydrological studies have focused on such seasonal scale heat waves, with fewer recent studies beginning to consider the shorter term glaciohydrological responses. However, it's this regional and subseasonal knowledge gap that's in fact the exact spatial and temporal scales for which my deep learning model is most suitable. To simulate the streamflow response to heat waves then, I take two main steps. First, I add in a 10 degree warm temperature anomaly for a seven day period. And then I evaluate how the modeled river flows change. As an example, here are some results shown for a single heat wave at two different rivers. On the left is a river with few glaciers, and on the right is a river with many glaciers. Blue shows a scenario with a heat wave occurring beginning on May 1st, while black shows a scenario without this heat wave. Both of these rivers experience higher flows due to snowmelt during that heat wave but only the highly glaciated river experiences nearly normal summer flows due to glacier compensation. And shown here is the difference between the heat wave and the normal scenarios. I quantify the impact of the heat wave by the initial maximum increase delta Q max and also the delayed deficit delta Q min, both of which measure different aspects of glacier compensation. We can consider how these two metrics, delta Q max and delta Q min, both vary as functions of heat wave timing as well as glacier coverage. Here are delta Q max and delta Q min versus the timing of heat wave onset for non glacier fed rivers, indicating large streamflow responses for spring heat waves, 
and nearly negligible responses for summer heat waves. Now, left to right shows the same results for increasing amounts of glacier coverage. We see that increasing glacier coverage is associated with a greater initial streamflow response in summer, physically explainable by glacier runoff, as well as a diminished streamflow deficit in response to spring heat waves, again, measuring glacier compensation in summertime after a spring heat wave. With this modeling framework in mind, then, we can also ask a range of interesting questions. For example, how sensitive is heat wave driven spring flooding to yearly annual temperatures? I raised the mean annual temperature by two degrees, and here is modeled streamflow in basins without glaciers. Importantly, there is an expected shift in streamflow with increased winter and spring flows. Spring is really the time that we care about for flooding. And so we might want to know if a heat wave hits right at the time when spring flows are most increased, will it result in higher flows overall compared to what would happen in the cooler climate? The short answer is, well, not necessarily. Here are simulated heat wave scenarios in both the normal and warmer climate scenarios. What's interesting is that the peak flows achieved in both cases are actually quite similar. The key here is that while spring flow is increased due to the warmer annual temperatures, there is a lessened ability for a heat wave to drive additional runoff. The implication of this is that heat wave driven flooding is not necessarily made worse. This finding, though, is in a world where only temperature has been increased and the heat wave characteristics remain the same. And so I think future work should emphasize the dynamical roles of climate change in altering um, both the qualities of the heat wave as well as the qualities of the climate more overall. I've written a paper that's in review at Water Resources Research covering these ideas. Additionally, I was a part of a collaborative multidisciplinary study on the BC heat wave of June 2021, which is in review at Nature Communications. Furthermore, I've explored the relationship between heat waves, glaciers, and society in an op-ed that I wrote for the Globe and Mail, as well as through radio interviews with Global News. I'd like to now offer some overall reflections on what I've learned and where I think we should be going as a field. We've really covered a lot of ground today. I've shown how the loss of glaciers will make communities vulnerable in Alberta. I've built a deep machine learning model that's both accurate and interpretable across Western Canada. And I've investigated the streamflow response to heat waves. I've written and communicated quite frequently about these topics, including in scientific journals, as well as in media outlets. And through all of this work, what's really become clear to me is that while progress has been made, there is still enormous potential to continue on this line of thinking. Firstly, there are numerous opportunities to improve the deep learning model's performance and overall general usefulness. For example, the input data could be enriched through the inclusion of additional relevant variables, including temporally static descriptors or those that describe catchment functioning. The model architecture could likely be improved through the use of transformers, which have recently been replacing both CNNs and LSTMs for various applications. And we can use techniques like transfer learning to take advantage of streamflow data from different regions and time periods. We can then ask, do changes to model structure alter the model interpretability results? How do how we build these models influence how and what they're learning? Furthermore, we should consider that in addition to the median streamflow response to heat waves shown here in black, it's important to further our understanding of the interannual variability of this response. We should consider, understand, and characterize the conditions that drive the largest and smallest responses to heat waves, how these conditions vary in space and time, as well as the implications under climate change. Finally, 
I'd like to step a back, to take a step back and zoom out a little bit. At the start of this talk, I claimed that glaciers and the rivers they feed have both broad and deep importance, and that the loss of glaciers under climate change will have these cascading cultural, political, and social impacts. The work that I've been presenting today touches on these ideas, particularly when we're thinking about water supply, but these are fundamentally social and political problems. And the primary barriers to progress are also social and political. When I speak about my work, the question that I'm most often asked is, well, what can I do about climate change? What can I do for glaciers? And I advocate for agency. I talk about voting and rejecting fossil fuel propaganda and personally connecting with glaciated places. However, if I'm being honest, I've often felt that through my scientific work, I've been almost unable to give a very satisfying answer to this very simple question, even though it sits right at the heart of my work. Considering this, it's clear to me that perhaps the most urgent need for the field is collaboration between physical scientists and scholars in the social sciences and humanities in order to answer questions like, how should communities adapt to the loss of glacier ice? And what do communities actually feel about this change? And what are their goals under deglaciation? Then also considering the other global crisis that we are facing as a society, what can glaciologists learn from the social and political responses that have occurred in response to COVID? I think that such inter and transdisciplinary thinking is going to be key for the academy even more broadly to maintain status and relevance in the eyes of the public as we experience further and more devastating climate change. I have now one final statement to make. From this talk, you can forget everything else, but I would like you to remember these two final words that summarize my PhD and also express a fundamental truth about life in Western Canada and in mountain regions around the world. Ice matters. Ice matters for over a million Albertans whose summer water supplies are made more vulnerable by the loss of glacier ice. Ice matters for being able to understand the decision-making of deep machine learning models. Ice matters for determining how a river and those downstream respond to acute severe heat waves in Western Canada. And perhaps most importantly, ice matters for us to connect with and understand these places in which we live. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I look forward to having further discussion and hearing from you after this presentation. Thank you.